10,000 hour rule, fact or fiction? The 10,000 hour rule is based on the idea that any person can become an expert in any field, including sporting, in 10,000 hours. The idea was popularised in 2008 by Canadian journalist Malcolm Gladwell who coined the 10,000 hour rule. Gladwell estimated that it took the Beatles around 10,000 hours to reach musical success and Bill Gates about the same amount of time to reach success in the computing industry. The rule has since been applied to all fields of life, including sport. But where did that information come from? In 1993, Anders Ericsson published the results of a study on a group of violin students from a National Musical Academy and found that the most accomplished students had spent on average 10,000 hours of practice by the time they were 20 years old. From this study, Gladwell coined the 10,000 hour rule. You might be asking, what's so bad about that? Well, let's take a look at the study a little further. Firstly, the authors of the 1993 paper, The Role of Deliberate Practice in the Acquisition of Expert Performance, reported no measures of variance. That means no information on the range of times taken to reach expert status was given. Further, Gladwell chose the 10,000 hour number based on when the participants reached 20 years of age, merely because 10,000 hours was a nice sounding round number. The number 7400 could just as easily have been chosen based off the amount of practice players had at the age of 18. Secondly, participants were asked to retrospectively estimate the time taken to reach expert status. This brings into question all sorts of problems related to participant memory and issues with responder bias. But perhaps the biggest issue with the 1993 study was that participants were already pre-selected into a National Musical Academy when asked to estimate the hours of practice it had taken to reach expert status. This is what scientists refer to as a severe restriction bias. Let's consider this example. If I were to gather all of the players in the NBA and ask them to retrospectively estimate how many hours of practice they had undertaken, then I'd guess the number would be high, perhaps 5,000, 10,000, or even 20,000 hours of practice. Yet that approach entirely ignores the fact that the players might also have an average height of seven foot, an arm span of seven foot three, and a 40 inch vertical jump. Yes, practice is important, but the biology that allows for that superior performance must already be present. In fact, innate physical abilities might be crucially important and no amount of practice may overcome these. A 1996 study on vision in Major League Baseballers found that players in the Dodgers Major League Baseball team had on average 20-13 vision, with some players as low as 29. That means that on average, the players were able to see clearly at 20 feet what most people can see clearly at 13 feet. In fact, based on recent studies, evidence indicates that less than 2% of the population has vision better than 2017, and only 0.01% of the population have a vision of 2010. This indicates that no matter how much you might practice, if you do not have exceptional vision, you'll likely not be a professional Major League Baseballer. Examples of these natural physical abilities are not hard to find. Think of the men's 100 meter final at the Olympics. This is not to suggest that practice isn't important, rather the practice is vital if you already have the natural goods. Gladwell has since stated that the rule is best suited to complex tasks like chess, where participants have great deals of information to remember. However, a recent study on chess grandmasters, the highest level attainable, found that on average it took players 10,000 hours to reach grandmaster status, but that one player had done so in as little as 3,000 hours, while another had taken 23,000 hours. These examples of variants are common. In 2007, Stefan Holm, the world and Olympic high jump champion, with a retrospectively self-assessed 20,000 hours of practice, was beaten by Donald Thomas, who had begun high jump seven months earlier after winning a high school bet. Scientific analysis of Thomas revealed that he possessed a very long Achilles tendon that provided enormous elastic potential and thus greatly improved his high jump potential. It is worth mentioning that the average amount of practice is around 10,000 hours between both of these men. However, the variance is enormous. In similar fashion, Australian Michelle Steele became a Winter Olympian after only 14 months of practice on the skeleton due to her already great 30 meter sprint ability. 
Likewise, Australian netball player Vicky Wilson had only 600 hours of practice when she made the national team. In fact, most of the team had started at 17 years of age and had only taken four years to reach the pinnacle of the sport, far short of the 10,000 hours, or approximately 10 years, apparently required. Further, a 2014 Princeton University meta-analysis of 88 studies on deliberate practice found that practice only explained 18% of the variance in performance for sporting domains. Surprisingly, practice only explained 21% of the variance for music and only 1% of the variance for professions. Finally, prospective studies to identify some of the potential reasons for the variation underlying performances has been done. Most notably, Bouchard in 2011 found that the response of VO2 max to training was enormous, with some individuals improving by 5% and others by 30%. Critically, it was found that it was possible using genetic techniques to identify which polymorphisms or gene variants are responsible for this huge difference. Bouchard found that 50% of an individual's starting VO2 max and the other 50% of an individual's trainability is heritable. In terms of sport, the point is this. Practice makes perfect, but only if the biology already allows for it. Thanks for watching.